Obviously, we want to be wealthy and we want to get there in this lifetime without having to rely on luck. A lot of people think making money is about luck. It's not. It's about becoming the kind of person that makes money. You know, I like to think that if I lost all my money and if you drop me on a random street in any English speaking country within five to 10 years, I'd be wealthy again, <laughs> right? Because it's just a skill set that I've developed and I think anyone can develop. You know, in a thousand parallel universes, you want to be wealthy in 999 of them. You don't want to be wealthy in the 50 of them where you got lucky. So we want to factor luck out of it. There's really four kinds of luck that we were talking about. This came from a book, P. Mark, uh, Mark Andreessen wrote a blog post about it. But there's different kinds of luck. The first kind of luck you might just say is like blind luck, where I just got lucky because something completely out of my control happened. You know, that's fortune, that's fate, etc. Then there's luck that comes through persistence, hard work, hustle, motion, which is when you're just running around creating lots of opportunities, you're generating a lot of energy, you're doing a lot of things, lots of things will just get stirred up in the dust. It's almost like mixing a, a petri dish and seeing what combines or, or mixing a bunch of reagents and seeing what combines. You're just generating enough force and hustle and energy that luck will find you. A third way is that you just become very good at spotting luck. So if you are very skilled in a field, you will notice when a lucky break happens in that field and other people who aren't attuned to it won't notice. So you become sensitive to luck and that's through skill and knowledge and work. And then the last kind of luck is the weirdest, hardest kind, but that's what we want to talk about, which is where you build a unique character, a unique brand, a unique mindset, where then luck finds you. For example, let's say that you're the best person in the world at deep sea underwater diving and you're known to like take on deep sea underwater dives that nobody else will even attempt to dare. And then by sheer luck, somebody finds a sunken treasure ship off the coast they can't get at. Well, their luck just became your luck because they're gonna come to you to get that treasure and you're gonna get paid for it. Now that's an extreme example, but it's just showing how like the person who got lucky by finding the treasure chest, that was blind luck. But them coming to you and asking you to extract it and having to give you half, that's not luck. You created your own luck. You put yourself in a position to be able to capitalize on that luck or to attract that luck when nobody else has created that opportunity for themselves. So when we talk about without getting lucky, we want to be deterministic. We don't want to leave it to chance. I mean, remember, I started as a poor kid in India, right? So if I can make it, anybody can, in that sense. Now, obviously, I had all my limbs and I had my mental faculties and I did have an education. So there are some prerequisites you can't get past. But if you're listening to this video or podcast, you probably have the requisite means at your disposal, which is a functioning body and a functioning mind. And I've encountered plenty of bad luck along the way. The first little fortune that I made, I instantly lost in the stock market. The second little fortune that I made or I should have made, I got cheated by my business partners. It's only the third time around has been a charm. And even then it has been a slow and steady struggle. And I haven't made money in my life in one giant payout. It's always been a whole bunch of small things piling up. So it's more about consistently creating wealth by creating businesses and creating opportunities and creating investments. It hasn't been like a giant one-off thing. My personal wealth has not been generated by one big year. It just stacks up little bit chips at a time, more options, more businesses, more investments, more things I can do. Same way, someone like a Nenad, Dale Asertis, he's building his brand online, he's building videos. It's not like any one video is going to suddenly shower him with riches overnight. It's going to be a long lifetime of learning, of reading, of creating, that's just gonna compound. So we're talking about getting wealthy so you can retire, so you have your freedom not retire in the sense that you don't do anything, but in the sense that you don't have to be any place you don't want to be, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do, and you can wake up when you want, you can sleep when you want, you don't have a boss. That's freedom. So we're talking about enough wealth to get to freedom, and especially thanks to the internet these days, those opportunities are massively abundant. I, in fact, have too many ways to make money. I don't have enough time. I literally have opportunities pouring out of my ears, and the thing I keep running out of is time. There's just so many ways to create wealth, to create products, to create businesses, to create opportunities, and to, as a byproduct, get paid by society that I just can't even handle it all. One of the things I think that is important to making money, when you want the kind of reputation that makes people do deals through you, 
you know, I use the example of like, if you're a great diver, then treasure hunters will come and give you a piece of the treasure for your diving skills. If you're a trusted, reliable, high integrity, long-term thinking deal maker, then when other people want to do deals, but they don't know how to do them in a trustworthy manner with strangers, they will literally approach you and give you a cut of the deal or offer you a unique deal just because of the integrity and reputation that you've built up. Warren Buffett, he gets offered deals and he gets to buy companies and he gets to buy warrants and bail out banks and do things that other people can't do because of his reputation. But of course, that's fragile. It has accountability on the line. It has a strong brand on the line. And as we will talk about later, that comes with accountability attached. But I would say your character, your reputation, these are things that you can build that then will let you take out advantage of opportunities that other people may characterize as lucky, but you know that it wasn't lucky. People seem to think that you can create wealth and make money through work. And it's probably not going to work. There are many reasons for that, but the most basic is just that your inputs are very closely tied to your outputs. In almost any salary job, even a one that's paying a lot per hour, like a lawyer or a doctor, you're still putting in the hours and every hour you get paid. So what that means is when you're sleeping, you're not earning. When you're retired, you're not earning. When you're on vacation, you're not earning. And you can't earn non-linearly. If you look at even doctors who get rich, like really rich, it's because they open a business. They open like a private practice and that private practice builds a brand and that brand attracts people or they build some kind of a medical device or a procedure or a process where they have intellectual property. So essentially you're working for somebody else and that person is taking on the risk and has the accountability and the intellectual property and the brand. So they're just not going to pay you enough. They're going to pay you the bare minimum that they have to to get you to do the job. And that can be a high bare minimum, but it's still not going to be true wealth where you're retired. And then Finally, you're actually just not even creating that much original for society. Like I said, this tweet storm should have been called How to Create Wealth. It's just How to Get Rich was a more catchy title. But you're not creating new things for society. You're just doing things over and over. And you're essentially replaceable because you're now doing a set role. Most set roles can be taught. If they can be taught, like in a school, then eventually you're going to be competing with someone who's got more recent knowledge, who's been taught and is coming in to replace you you're much more likely to be doing a job that can be eventually replaced by a robot or by an AI. And it doesn't even have to be wholesale replaced overnight. It can be replaced a little bit of a time and that eats into your wealth creation and therefore your earning capability. So fundamentally, your inputs are matched to your outputs, you are replaceable and you're not being creative. I just don't think that that is a way that you can truly make money. So everybody who really makes money at some point owns a piece of a product or a business or some kind of IP. That can be through stock options. So if you can be working at a tech company, that's a fine way to start. But usually the real wealth is created by starting your own companies or by, you know, even investors, they're in an investment firm and they're buying equity. So these are much more the routes to wealth. It doesn't come three hours. You really just want a job or a career or a profession where your inputs don't match to your outputs. So if you look at modern society, again, this is later in the tweet storm, Businesses that have high creativity and high leverage tend to be ones where you could do an hour of work and it can have a huge effect, or you can do a thousand hours of work and it can have no effect. For example, look at software engineering. One great engineer can, for example, create Bitcoin and create billions of dollars worth of value. And an engineer who's working on the wrong thing or not quite as good or just not as creative or thoughtful or whatever can work for an entire year and every piece of code they ship ends up not getting used customers don't want it. That is an example of a profession where the input and the outputs are highly disconnected. It's not based on the number of hours that you put in. Whereas on the extreme other end, if you're a lumberjack, even the best lumberjack in the world, assuming they're not working with tools, so the inputs and outputs are pretty connected and just using an ax or a saw, the best lumberjack in the world may be like 3x better than one of the worst lumberjacks, right? It's not going to be a gigantic difference. So you want to look for professions and careers where the inputs and the outputs are highly disconnected. This is another way of saying that you want to look for things that are leveraged. And by leverage, I don't mean financial leverage alone, like Wall Street uses, and that has a bad name. I'm just talking about tools. We're using tools. 
computer is a tool that software engineers use. If I'm a lumberjack with bulldozers and automatic robot axes and saws, I'm going to be using tools and have more leverage than someone who's just using his bare hands and trying to rip the trees out by their roots. Tools and leverage are what create this disconnection between inputs and outputs. Creativity, so the higher the creativity component of a profession, the more likely it is to have disconnected inputs and outputs. So I think that if you're looking at professions where your inputs and your outputs are highly connected, it's going to be very, very, very hard to create wealth and make wealth for yourself in that process. There are two tweets that I put out that are related. So the first one I was talking about, we were talking about how your lifestyle you know, has to upgrade, shouldn't get upgraded too fast. And that one said, people who are living far below their means enjoy a freedom that people busy upgrading their lifestyles just can't fathom. And I think that's very important, like just to not upgrade your lifestyle all the time to maintain your freedom. And it just gives you a freedom of operation. Once you make a little bit of money, you still want to be living like your old self so that just the worry goes away. So don't run out to upgrade that house lifestyle and all that stuff. Let's say you're getting paid a thousand dollars an hour. The problem is that when you go into a work lifestyle like that, you don't just suddenly go from making $20 an hour to making a thousand dollars an hour. That's a progression over a long career. And as that happens, one subtle problem is that you upgrade your lifestyle as you make more and more money. And that upgrading of the lifestyle ups what you consider to be wealth and you stay in this wage slave trap. So I forget who said it, maybe it was Nassim Taleb, but he said, you know, the most dangerous things are heroin and a monthly salary, right? Because they're highly addictive. The way you want to get wealthy is you want to be poor and working and working and working. And this is, for example, how the tech industry works, where you don't make any money for 10 years. And then suddenly in year 11, you might have a giant payday, which is, what, by the way, one reason why these very high marginal tax rates for the so-called wealthy are flawed, because the highest risk taking, most creative professions literally lose money for a decade of your life while you take massive risk and you bleed and bleed and bleed. And then suddenly in year 11 or year 15, you might have one single big payday. But then, of course, Uncle Sam show up and say, hey, you know what? You just made a lot of money this year. Therefore, you're rich. Therefore, you're evil. And you got to hand it all over to us. So it just destroys those kinds of creative risk taking professions. But ideally, you want to make your money in discrete lumps separated over long periods of time so that your own lifestyle does not have a chance to adapt quickly and then you can say okay now i'm done now i'm retired now i'm free i'm still gonna work because you gotta do something with your life but i'm gonna work on only the things that i want when i want and it's gonna be much more creative expression and much less about money so essentially as we talked about before money is ious from society saying you did something good in the past now here's something that we owe you for the future and so society will pay you for creating things that it wants but society doesn't yet know how to create those things because if it did it would need you they would already be stamped out big time almost everything in your house in your workplace and on the street used to be technology at one point in time there was a time when oil was technology that made J.D. Rockefeller rich. There was a time when cars were technology that made Henry Ford rich. So technology is just the set of things, as Alan Kay said, that don't quite work yet. Once something works, it's no longer technology. So society always wants new things. And if you want to be wealthy, you want to figure out which one of those things you can provide for society that it does not yet know how to get, but it will want that's natural to you and within your skill set, within your capabilities. And then you have to figure out how to scale it. Because if you just build one of it, that's not enough. You've got to build thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of them. So everybody can have one. Steve Jobs and his team, of course, figured out that society would want smartphones, computer in their pocket that had all the phone capability times 100 and be easy to use. So they figured out how to build that and then they figured out how to scale it and they figured out how to get one into every first world citizen's pocket and eventually every third world citizen too. And so because of that, they're handsomely rewarded and Apple is the most valuable company in the world. First, you create it just because you want it. You want it and you know how to build it and you need it. And so you build it for yourself. Then you figure out how to get it to other people. And then for a little while, rich people have it. Like, for example, rich people had chauffeurs and then they had black town cars. And then Uber came along and everyone's private driver was available to everybody. And now you can even see Uber pools that are replacing shuttle buses because it's more convenient. And then you get scooters, which are even further down market of that. So it's about distributing what rich people used to have to everybody. But the entrepreneur's job starts even before that, which is creation. 
entrepreneurship is essentially an act of creating something new from scratch, predicting that society will want it, and then figuring out how to scale it and get it to everybody in a profitable way and self-sustaining way. The fundamental property of the internet, more than any other single thing, is it connects every human to each other human on the planet. You can now reach everyone, whether it's by emailing them personally, whether it's by broadcasting to them on Twitter, whether it's by posting something on Facebook that they find, whether it's by putting a website they come and access. It connects everyone to everyone. So the internet is an inter-networking tool. It connects everybody. That is its superpower. So you want to use that. What that helps you figure out is that the internet means that you can find your audience for your product or your talent and skill, no matter how far away they are. For example, Nenad, who is Illustratus, if he was in these videos pre-internet, how would he get the message out there? It would just be, what would he do? He would run around where he lives in his neighborhood, showing it to people on a computer or a screen, or he would try to get it played in his local movie theater. It was impossible. It only works because he can put it on the internet. And then how many people in the world are really interested in it or even interested in what we're talking about are really going to absorb it, right? It's going to be a very small subset of humanity. The key is being able to reach them. So what the internet does is allows any niche obsession, which could be just the weirdest thing. It could be like people who collect snakes, to like people who like to ride hot air balloons, to people who like to sail around the world by themselves, just one person on a craft, or someone who's obsessed with miniature cooking, like there's this whole Japanese miniature cooking phenomenon, or there's a show about a woman who goes to people's houses and tidies it up, right? So whatever niche obsession you have, the internet allows you to scale. Now, that's not to say that what you build will be the next Facebook will reach billions of users. But if you just want to reach 50,000 passionate people like you, there's an audience out there for you. So the beauty of this is that we have 7 billion beings on this planet. The combinatorics of human DNA are incredible. Everyone is completely different. You'll never meet any two people who are vaguely similar to each other that can substitute for each other. It's not like you can say, well, Nivi just left my life so I can have this other person come in and he's just like Nivi and I get the same feelings, the same responses and the same ideas. No. There are no substitutes for people. People are completely unique. So given that each person has different skill sets, different interests, different obsessions, and it's that diversity that becomes a creative superpower. So each person can be creatively superb at their own unique thing. But before, that didn't matter because if you were living in a little fishing village in Italy, like your fishing village didn't necessarily need your completely unique skill and you had to conform to just the few jobs that were available. But now today, you can be completely unique you can go out on the internet and you can find your audience and you can build a business and create a product and build wealth and make people happy just uniquely expressing yourself through the internet. Space of careers has been so broad. Esports players, people making millions of dollars playing Fortnite, people creating videos and uploading them, YouTube broadcasters, bloggers, you know, uh, podcasters, Joe Rogan, I read true or false, I don't know, but I read that he's going to make about $100 million a year on his podcast and he's had 2 billion downloads. Even PewDiePie, this is a hilarious tweet that I retweeted the other day, PewDiePie is the number one trusted name in news. This is a kid, I think, in Sweden, and he's got three times the distribution of the top cable news networks just on his news channel. It's not even on his entertainment channel. The internet enables any niche interest, as long as you're the best at it, to scale out. And the great news is because every human is different, everyone is the best at something, you being themselves. Another tweet I had that is worth weaving in but didn't go into this tweet storm was a very simple one. I like things when they can compress them down because they're easy to remember and easy to hook on to. But that one was escape competition through authenticity. So when you're competing with people, it's because you're copying them. It's because you're trying to do the same thing. But every human is different. Don't copy. I know we're mimetic creatures and Rene Girard has a whole mimesis theory, but it's much easier than that. Don't imitate, don't copy, just do your own thing. No one can compete with you on being you. It's that simple. And so the more authentic you are to who you are and what you love to do, the less competition you're going to have. So you can escape competition through authenticity when you realize that no one can compete with you on being you. And normally that would have been useless advice pre-internet. Post-internet, you can turn that into a career.